It's going to be just part of our discourse here today. <clears throat> but uh, this is Old Testament. And uh, the question that I want to pose as a title today is, is what to do with Jesus. What to do with Jesus. The world has had a problem dealing with somebody who, who showed up and claimed he was God. Claimed he was the creator. And so, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And this is a sign from God. So, if you know signs, the sign was prophesied. And this in Isaiah chapter 7 is written about uh, 712 years before Jesus came. So, let's just figure it here. We're in the year 2016. If you go back 712 years, what would it be? 1300, right? 700 years ago would be the year 1300. Does that feel like a long time ago to you? I mean, the 1300s, people hadn't even discovered germs yet. They didn't do that until like 1860s. And then they put the guy in jail and, and uh, because he claimed that people were getting sick in one part of the hospital as a result of him traveling from people who were sick over here to somebody else, he began to realize something being transferred and uh, they ended up putting him in jail because they didn't believe what he was saying and it wasn't long after that they discovered germs. Everybody say germs. There's mental germs as well. It's called doubt and unbelief. And the world has had a problem with God who came. And so 712 years before Jesus was born, it was prophesied and a sign was given. Put that scripture back up there. A sign was given. So a sign is a sign. It tells you something's going to happen. And so the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Now this is the adult class, and we understand that that's an impossibility uh, for a virgin to conceive. And so we know that according to humanity that that Joseph and everybody else in the picture felt like that Mary had been unfaithful, at least to her engagement, and he was ready to call it off. And, but yet it's prophesied. A sign would be given, a virgin would conceive, and uh, of course it might have been pulled before. Somebody ended up expecting out of wedlock, and especially in those days that was not acceptable at all. Somebody might have pulled it before and, you know, tried to say, well, this is a miracle. Uh, but in this case, it really was. It really was a miracle. And uh, so a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted in Matthew 1 says, God with us. And then we're going to go to Isaiah 9, 6. And that's just a couple chapters later in prophecy. And uh, we can quote this scripture. Behold, let's put it up there for you to see. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And so this is a prophecy talking about a child will be born and a son will be given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called. And uh, everybody in the Old Testament was perked up about now because they all wanted to know the name of their God who they knew was an almighty God who delivered them in battle, who did amazing feats and they could call on God but they didn't have a name. And you know how that is. Other people in the world had a name for their God and their God was just a, a statue somewhere and so, uh, but you know, the people of God said we at least need to have a name for our God. And, of course, God means supreme being, a deity. And uh, people had made up other gods, but there really is only one supreme being. There's only one true living God. The There's one eternal God. There's only one God. Praise God. And so, 
<clears throat> unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name, and everybody's going to hold their breath right there, Isaiah sure was. His name shall be called Wonderful, and that's an adjective. And uh, there are actually 113 adjectives added to the name of God in the Old Testament, and yet all the time they're asking, what is your name? So if somebody's beautiful, that's fine, but what's her name? If somebody's wonderful, that's fine, but what's her name? And, uh, and so all of these names came across, wonderful, counselor, the mighty God. That's a pretty big revelation right there. This child that's going to be born is not going to be another God. It's not going to be one of three gods or a group of gods or whatever. This is going to be the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And so Isaiah prophesied. And then we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 52, verse 10. And uh, this is a revelation as well. I'm laying a foundation here for uh, a thought that we're working on here, and it's not going to take a long time, but uh, I just want you to see these scriptures firsthand, and it really is neat that together we can look at it on the screen. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm, and so in our minds now we're thinking of an arm. And if it's the arm of Almighty God and he is omnipresent, it must be a massive arm. Except that that's not the physical manifestation of God. His omnipresence is a spirit. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. And so uh, something's going on here. This is a, a, a representation of God that we have to look at. He's made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. We still don't know exactly what he's talking about. And I'm sure Isaiah doesn't either because Isaiah is just writing according to the inspiration of God. <clears throat> and the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So in Isaiah 52.10, the Lord has made bare his holy arm. And so it's used as a parallel, an arm. Uh, and then let's go to Isaiah 53, starting with the first verse. We're going to read down through here and just see scriptures. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm, there's that word, arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow. So that second word there is a revelation. This arm is he. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness that we, when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So he was not necessarily good looking. And that wasn't the purpose in the plan of God. And uh, yet some of the people made in the image of God are good looking. But for God's purpose and plan, he did not make Jesus good looking. And verse number three, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we, everybody say we. We, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But, but he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. So this arm is not really an arm, but it's represented as an arm. And so when we talk about somebody that means a lot to us, we might say that they're my right hand man or my right arm. And we're really just using a colloquialism to refer to the significance of them. And so 
the Lord God Almighty who is a, a spirit is referring to his body as a right arm. But you wouldn't be looking for a right arm per se because it is a he and he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's when Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. And he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so opened not him his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Now, you understand all of this is prophecy. A guy is just sitting in his room somewhere writing the word of God as God inspires it. And it is a prophecy of something that's going to happen a long time later. Everybody that is present in the day that this is written is going to be long gone. But scriptures are written and forever settled. And so people are going to read this. In fact, we're still reading it 2,000 years later or 2,700 years later. And it's amazing that it was prophesied. Now, some people who don't believe in Jesus say that all of this was just orchestrated by somebody to try to make it look like that, that he fulfilled these prophecies. But these perfectly fit Jesus because Jesus was God. So he was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. All of this fits every cog of the wheel. Everything is perfectly fit. And with the rich in his death. Because... The man that gave his tomb was very wealthy and he gave his tomb for Jesus to be buried in because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong the days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand that's where we're going to quit right there but the plan of God is that he would come and redeem us that he would do something to save us and many times in your life when there's something you're trying to uh, decide whether you're going to keep it or get rid of it uh, some people are hoarders. Do we have any hoarders here today? I know hoarders don't admit it. But you get to their house and, and uh, what? <laughs> so yes, you could look in my garage and you might think that I was a hoarder because when I look at things, I see the potential in them. And so if it's just a wire, I think, well, I could use this wire. And if it's a if it's a piece of furniture uh, and it's busted up and it you know I'm looking at the wood in the furniture and if it's just particle board or whatever throw it away but it might be oak it might be birch it might be maple and I'm looking for that and then I'm thinking of how I would cut it on my saw and make it into something else and so I put that aside with a whole bunch of other things <laughs> and uh, but, you know, people have always been trying to figure out what to do with this guy. Because he shows up and claims to be God. And what are we going to do? So all of the people in the Old Testament that were the people of God had an awareness that there was going to come a Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah. It is amazing that we can have our whole life be about something and miss it. We can have our whole life be about something and, and, and not even realize that it's present with us as we speak. 
And I think of the story of Acres of Diamonds because the man went around the world searching for treasure and come to find out that in his own property, in his own backyard, was the largest diamond field ever discovered. And all he needed to do, somebody came to his house one day and, and it was after he had already died. And, and, and there was a rock on the mantle of the fireplace and they looked up there and said, hey, do uh, you realize what you're looking at here? This is a diamond in the rough. Amazing. And so sometimes we have things right in our midst and we don't even understand what we have. The world knew that a Messiah was going to come and some people were looking for him, a few people were looking for him to come. The Bible records Anna and Simeon in the temple waiting throughout the whole Old Testament. These prophecies about a young Jewish girl that was going to show up expecting and it was going to be a miracle. And uh, I'm sure in their training, because they trained their children, every young girl wondered, would I be the one? Someone was going to be the one that God chose to come through as a miracle and a baby. So it was the wonder in each Jewish girl's mind, could I be the one? Nevertheless, many years went by and people were hearing about this. And some people, I'm sure, forgot about it. And some people didn't even know. And the amazing thing is, is when it did happen... People rejected it. It actually became a, a terrible plight for her to have this baby and people look at her in the way of disdain instead of admiration and respect. She was a, a godly young lady that God had chosen and, <clears throat> and yet she was a human. She was a person. God chose her to be the mother to mother the actual physical body of Jesus Christ. So that made her really special. Now we have to be careful that we don't end up worshiping something that God made special. And that's the reason the Lord took the body of Moses away from Israel because they were going to make, they were going to get stuck with somebody that God had used in a special way to deliver them from Egypt and to mean everything to them and then see miracles take place at his hands. But when his time was to go to be with the Lord, the Lord didn't want them getting sidetracked. There was going to be another leader to come. And so the Lord took the body away. And so, yes, Mary was the one that God chose. But also you got to know that Mary was there on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Ghost was poured out, Mary was in the upper room with 120. She needed to get the Holy Ghost just like everybody else. Nevertheless, she was a, a godly young woman. And, and while she was there, Elizabeth, her, her uh, cousin, uh, was aware. And uh, they, were, they were excited because she had already had an experience six months earlier with the Holy Ghost overshadowing her and her child, her being with child, and that was John the Baptist. Uh, he was not born uh, in, a, in a miracle, but nevertheless, he was anointed of God to be the forerunner. And, and so Elizabeth, his mother, knew about it. And she was excited. When she heard the news, she understood that, that this is the event. There's not going to be a bunch of these events. There's going to be one event like this because there's only one God, the Messiah that we've waited for all of these years. And now he's here. And some people don't even know it. Some people don't believe it. And it's, it's a big deal. And now... He's going to be born and it, it turns out that you heard the story. There's taxation and they got to travel. And uh, here they show up to Bethlehem, which was their city where they had to go to pay their taxes. And uh, they get to Bethlehem and there's so many people there that have come for every, from everywhere that there's no room. There's no room. And they go from place to place. And I don't know how many times you've recognized and felt like you're a child of God. And, and God has blessed your life. And, and, uh, and you are really somebody in God. And yet terrible things happen. And you wonder, why is this happening to me? You know, I'm, I'm a child of God. But the Bible says time and happenstance comes to us all. So you might get sick. 
You might have an accident. You might have a, a fender bender. You might have things happen in your life and uh, it doesn't make you any less special to God. But God's going to see you through every situation. So don't ever lose faith and lose heart when circumstances take place because this is an amazing story and we're talking about the mother, the mother of Jesus and the man that was going to escort her as a husband and they're looking for a place to lodge for the night and not really sure when this baby's going to be born but it could be born here and they're going from place to place and you would think that everything would just be set and ready to go but no sorry we don't have any room we're sold out and finally they just find somebody that says well if you know if you got to have some place to just lay your head you can you can go out back and there's going to be a stable out there and there's animals there and there's hay there and, and at least you know it's better than being out in the cold with nothing and so I, I guess you could just go out back and we don't have any rooms left in our inn and that's the way it was everywhere they went that's the way it was when Jesus came he did not come with all the pomp and circumstance and the splendor and the glory that he came from he came nondescript he came not necessarily welcomed and then as he began to grow people resented him Herod resented him Herod was such a selfish person that he was not even going to tolerate the thought of a king being born. Nevertheless, that he would probably already be dead whenever that king would come into play. But he was so selfish, he wanted to make sure that, that no king was born. So he put out a decree to kill all the babies. Two years old and younger as he tried to figure out the timing. And in Israel, it was prophesied. All the way back in Isaiah, it says... It says, I think it uses the, the mother, what name does it use, Rahab? Uh, some mother, it says that the mothers of Israel are going to be crying because their babies are not. And Herod has killed all the two-year-old babies and what a terrible selfishness of somebody that and so the parents found out about the decree and they had to go back a different way and Jesus was too and already being rejected everywhere he turned. Then as he got a little bit older and began to talk about his calling, even his parents had a little problem with, with his calling because it was over their head. And then as he began to teach and talk to people and come into his ministry everywhere he turned it was a lot of rejection we go back to Isaiah 53 he was he was rejected we we esteemed him stricken smitten of God afflicted we we turned our face away from him we don't want anything to do with him this was his plight in life wherever he went people were trying to figure out and then as he began to declare really who he was he stepped up in the temple one day and he read a scripture from the old testament and he said this scripture today is fulfilled in your ears that was an amazing scripture. He said he came to set the captive free. He came to heal the brokenhearted. And, and people are saying, who do you think you are? And you can understand. I mean, we don't really allow that among us. You have people among us trying to really make strides spiritually. And we have a whole lot of reins holding them back. Because, you know, you don't want to get too high too fast. You might crash. Nevertheless, if you feel a calling in your heart and you're like Joseph, you start telling the story and people resent it. Your brothers hate it and people are jealous of it. You're pregnant with a miracle and nobody wants to buy it because how in the world could you do that and I don't have that. Well, you have whatever you have as you sacrifice and give yourself unto God. And sacrifice is not necessarily just some killing thing. It's just that you could have used this dollar for this that or the other but you gave it to God it makes it a sacrifice some sacrifices are small and maybe some are large but as you do whatever you do as unto God you are doing it 
with faith and you're doing it with understanding. And so we need to make room for people to grow. We need to make room for people to be pregnant and expecting a miracle. You look at some of your children, you look at some of your relatives, you look at some of the impossibilities and, and then somewhere in your heart sparks an attitude of faith and you claim that they're going to be saved and others are kind of raising their eyebrow thinking, you know, that guy's pretty bad. I don't see it. I don't see how it's possible. Well, that's exactly where God works. And nobody could see this. Even the people that did see it had a problem with it. And even those that were totally convinced like John the Baptist ended up saying, <clears throat> uh, so I've told everybody you're the one. Now I need to find out if you're really the one. So I mean, it's pretty amazing. He doubted. And everybody that knew the Messiah was coming ended up saying, mm, I don't know. So you can, you can relate to that. Somebody shows up and says something and you're thinking, mm, I don't know about this. But as it began to be more of a revelation and more of a claim, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they started putting two and two together and saying, wait a minute here. We know where you were born. We know your parents. We know that can't be. This is blasphemy. And everywhere he turned, he was rejected. He was rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid our faces from him. And that's what happened in his life. And the question still remains today is people are trying to figure out what to do with Jesus. In 325, when they had announced the Council of Nicaea and they're spending their time in a religious setting trying to come up with something that would solidify the Roman Empire because it was in a civil war and the religion was adding to the conflict. They had a, they had a council and there was five different philosophies there and, and uh, there was only one there that said we can't budge from what we believe this is an absolute Jesus is God manifested in the flesh and the rest of them had a compromise and came up with a with a doctrine and an idea this is how we'll approach it this is what we'll call it this is what we'll say about it and they're still trying to figure out who is Jesus is he just a man is he a prophet in the Bible, you know, in Matthew uh, or in the Gospels, Nicodemus comes and says, we know you're a prophet, a good man, a teacher from God. And uh, some people believe that. Some people, different religions of our day, uh, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, the Muslims, they don't deny the existence of Jesus. They, some of them say he, he was just a good prophet. He was a man. God used him in that time and now he's going to use other people today. And we have our current prophet and uh, whoever in their religion it might be. And they're trying to figure out where do we put this guy who claims he is the all in all. He claims he is God. Trying to find a place for Jesus is an issue. And so, in Matthew 16, the Lord gave Peter the keys to the kingdom. And in Acts chapter 2, he gave, got up and gave a discourse, an introduction to the keys. And his introduction to the keys were is that all of you builders, counted everybody as a builder, you have taken the chief cornerstone and thrown him in the weeds. Now you're trying to build a wall and you can't make it all work because it's a puzzle. And without this chief cornerstone where it belongs, everything is not going to work. You have crucified the Messiah. You have killed the chief cornerstone. And so they were pricked in their heart, the Bible says, and they said, what should we do? And the answer is you need to put him back at the head of the corner. A corner is a place where from there you can go anywhere. But if it's in the middle of the wall, then you got to go to the corner to go some other which way. And if it's a building, 
and God's building the building, then Jesus has got to be the foundation of the building. He's got to be the chief cornerstone. He's got to be the beginning. He's got to be everything in your life. And so even now people are trying to figure out in this church sitting here today, how much of a Christian do I really want to be? Do I want to be a fanatic like the world looks at us and says, well, you guys go to church too much and you really put too much in this or, or am I going to just relegate him to something down the line a little bit and, and not quite make him so center? We sing the song, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. You're the center of my life. And that's really the whole point is that unless you make him your center, everything else is not going to work. And the best that you can make it work is way less than what God intended. He is made to be the center of your life. When it comes to photography, it's like when you're looking in the camera and there's that center point that's a focal point and you can focus there. The rest of the picture will be as you design it. When you get Jesus in the middle of your picture, your whole picture is going to be in focus. Everything will be in relationship to that. There is nothing wrong with being called a fanatic. There's nothing wrong with having Jesus first in your life because after that, everything fits. And there's a whole lot of things. I preached the old message a while back about it's not just so much do's and don'ts as it is first and seconds. And the do's and don'ts really do count. But the first and seconds are the real deal, and that is that you need to put God first. There's some things that will never be second because they're not right. But there's some things, a whole lot of things in life that are fine to be second as long as God is first. And we talk about sports, we talk about hobbies, we talk about our life, our children, our families, our husband, our wife, everything else in life is fine to be second. But God's got to be first. We got to put Jesus first. So we're in a season where people are trying to figure out where do we put this guy? Is he going to sit on the throne? Is he going to sit on the right side? Is he, is he going to be everything or is he going to be just something? Is he, a, is he a teacher? Is he a prophet? Where does he fit? The question today is where does he fit in your life? Where does he fit in your life? Because if you receive the Holy Ghost and you become a child of God, the Bible says you're not your own, you're bought with a price. The price on Calvary paid for you and now your life has got a calling and your calling is going to define you. I promise you it's going to be the most exciting and best calling you could ever have. And everything in life that's fun will be more fun when Jesus is the center. Everything that's wonderful will be more wonderful. Food will taste better. I promise you. Your marriage will work better. Your enemies will love you. Well, like you. Everything goes better when you figure out where to put Jesus. But when he got here, they didn't have any room for him. And his whole life he was rejected. And, you know, he healed somebody in the Gadarenes. And, and, and the devils went into the pigs. And the Gadarenes says, get out of our country and don't come back because you cost us 2,000 swine. Never mind the ultimate value of one soul that's worth more than the whole world, not just 2,000 pigs. So he was not allowed to go back in that country according to them. But you can't really quarantine God. He's omnipresent, right? Amen. And so that was their take on it. In other words, we don't want him. Even the atheist, the Bible said, is a fool because he says there's no God. You can't get rid of God just because you don't want him. He's there. You have to decide where in your life you're going to put him. And I grew up in church, so I grew up hearing that you got to put Jesus first. Yeah. And when you put him first, your life is going to be happy and fulfilled. It's going to be wonderful. Everybody has always wondered where to put him. A whole lot of people in America. America is really a Christian country. I know recently they've tried to identify it in other ways. But really, it's been based on Judean 
Christian principles out of, of the Bible. And right now there are somewhere between 250 and 260 million people in America that call themselves Christians. But I got to tell you that probably most of them haven't yet figured out where to put Jesus. They got him as a hobby. They got him as a once a week or once a month or maybe Easter. They got him somewhere in their life, maybe at least in a, an acknowledgement. But until you put him first, you're trying to make something work that's never going to work. And you don't do that in relationship to me. You do that in relationship to God. And when you do put him first, you have all of his blessings. You have all of his promises. You have everything you need. On the worst day, you have confidence to know that God's on your side. On the best day, you know you're blessed. But you can't go wrong when you figure out where to put him. So the day of Pentecost was a message that said, you put the stone in the wrong place. This is where you need to put it. And they somehow felt convicted and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Jesus went to Calvary. He was born, he lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And Acts 2.38 on this back wall is that picture applied to your life. The death is repentance, the burial is baptism, and the resurrection is the Holy Ghost. That means Jesus became the center of your life. Now your job is to keep him there. And there's all kinds of temptations and callings and whatever for your time. But the business of serving God is keeping Jesus in the middle. I don't know if you've noticed, but we have church on Wednesday. And I've noticed that if you don't make it to church on Wednesday, there's something missing. I noticed if I'm sick or I can't make it or even if I'm somewhere else, I know that there has been something missed in the stride of going toward God. When I come back, I'm a little bit more sensitive. I'm a little bit more hungry because I have missed one of my... I mean, it's kind of like missing a meal. You want to... Want to go on a fast with me? Some people will, will fast all night and then they have a break fast in the morning. We'll let that breakfast, we'll let that breakfast sink in, okay? <laughs> they might eat, you know, eggs and bacon instead of steak or maybe they'll have steak and eggs, whatever, but that's a breakfast. Break fast. But did you want to go on a three-day fast? No. None of our flesh wants to go on a three-day fast. We don't want to go on a fast. I can tell when I have missed a meal in the spirit. How about you? I can tell. Then I worry about some people that haven't been to church for six months or a year. And I'm thinking, man, they're, they're starving to death. They, they, they haven't really touched God. In fact, they've just all totally forgotten. They're, they're like comatose because they haven't touched God. It's not about us. It's not about here. It's just simply about we got to put Jesus in the middle of our life. And then there's people in the world that say that's asking too much. We don't mind putting him as a teacher, or as, a, as a friend. We don't mi mind putting him as a good guy. And I had a discourse with a man that came to talk to me about a job at my house. I think I've mentioned it, but I'll mention it as closing here today. He was an Israeli, and he was very religious. And when he found out I was a preacher, and we, we got to talking, he forgot what he came for, and we spent probably uh, an hour or two standing in my kitchen talking. And uh, he was teaching me, and I was teaching him, and he was like, thrilled in his soul and uh, and the same question is this question today he trying to figure out what to do with Jesus because you know Jesus was a Jew right yes I do <laughs> he was one of us kind of like you guys don't own him we own him yeah he was 
really an imposter? I said, hmm, how do you know that? Well, he, he made claims they weren't, they weren't true. I said, well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Your Bible, back in the Old Testament, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Do you believe that? I believe that. Do you believe that the government's going to be on his shoulders and his name's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God? Yes, sir. The big thing that he struck with me is that he believes in only one God, and so do I. He couldn't get that figured out. He goes, you guys believe in three gods? I said, no, we don't either. We, we know Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. We believe in one God. You sure? I'm sure. I'm really sure. I started quoting him scriptures and he was like really baffled. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to figure out. We don't deny that he existed, but he was really an imposter. He, he, he really was a bad guy. Really? I told him, I said, I'm, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. God's going to give you a revelation someday. It might be all the way till, and I'll just tell you, if the Lord came today in just a few years, the Antichrist is going to sacrifice a pig in the Jewish temple. And he goes, a pig? There's no way. I said, well, you're going to strike up with a guy that's got power and he's a peacemaker in the world and you guys are going to help finance him and you're going to back him and you're going to believe in him and you're going to think he's the Messiah. So he's going to be a Jew. If you guys give him the credentials, the, the Antichrist is going to be a Jew. But you're going to know he's not the right Jew when he sacrifices a pig in your temple. And you are going to wake up and you're going to find out who Jesus is. Not was. Is. The Bible says that during the tribulation there are going to be man-child Jews and remnant seed Jews. And the remnant sea Jews are going to be martyrs that come up to heaven because they have come to understand who Jesus is. I'm just telling you, everybody in the world needs to figure out where to put Jesus. Let's stand. I think we ought to sing that song again, All Hail King Jesus, because he is the king. The world right now, and especially some people in our country, are scared to death of the president-elect. And it is a scary thought because it's probably one of the most, if not the most, powerful positions in the whole world. But we got to put Jesus in his right place. He is the king, not just the president. A president's got people in checks and balances in his life, and he can't just do anything he wants. But when you make somebody a king, they literally are the ultimate authority. Thank God that he loves us because if he goes like this, you're good. If he goes like this, you're bad. It's all in his power. And if he's going to be a king, a king has that kind of power. That's why we don't let mankind be kings. Because only Jesus is the king. But if you could make him king of your life, you don't have to be on the throne. You don't have to try to execute judgment you don't have to be jealous you don't have to worry you don't have to fret you just let him be king he takes care of it all and you get to be happy and you just praise him because he really is God and he loved us so much he paid the price himself and I want to thank him I want to thank him there were some wise men
during those times that came to pay homage to the king. They saw it in the universe. They bowed their heads and brought their gifts. And the lowly shepherds and all the others were amazed to know. Amazing that some people had the revelation and most people didn't. Today, you know who Jesus is. And I ask you right now, would you help me praise him from your heart? Praise him from your heart. Thank you, God, for coming. Because if you hadn't come, where would we be? Hallelujah. Let's sing it.